Imagine Story's tall artwork towering over bustling streets, which begs the question, does the art define the street or does the street define the artwork? Joining me is Priminda Jacob, art historian, associate professor of visual arts at UMBC. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, you are an art historian. You have a couple specialties which we're going to talk about. Um, but I want to ask you a little bit about artwork in India and street art. Um, when I think of India, um, I think of bustling streets with lots going on, lots of people. Um, and you're saying there's also lots of artwork. Yes, I mean, I, there's, a, there's so much of visual stimuli on the street. And I focused my research on advertisements for the cinema industry and for political parties. And these are very large scale um, images on the street. And I think that the reason for their sort of dominance on the street mm -hmm. is because they are really vibrantly colored. They're very, you know, they're large in the sense of like 100 feet long and 40 to 80 feet in wow. height. Yeah. And, um, and they, they need to be so dominant in order to kind of attract attention because mm. there's so much else going on on the street. Right. They have to, <laughs> they have to kind of, uh, you know, be dominant in that sense. Right. So you mentioned that there's, there's cinema, there's politicians, and then some of the pieces that I've seen that you've shown me, yeah. it's sort of photo art realism. It's, uh, can, so can you describe the artwork a little bit, what it looks like, what the process is? Yes, so the, the artwork is, it looks really photorealistic, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, you know, where that tradition comes from right. and how it like connects to India, because we think of photorealistic art and the realism as a Western tradition. But, ah, okay. um, so we go back to that a little yes. bit later, but basically the, um, the art is of um, stills from, uh, from the cinema. Um, you know, from films, that the artists are given a whole bunch of stills, they kind of mix and match them, and then they, um, they take the, the, the photographic still and they enlarge it to this, oh, I see. you know, massive scale by using, they used a slide projector to, to and by moving the slide projector. Make the image know, larger. Make yes. the image larger and then actually trace it out onto the, you know, a uh, hundred foot long, canvas wow. and then you know paint it uh, but the the photographic image is you know has muted colors and they in fact would paint it with a huge range of oh, I see. intensely uh, bright colors right. artistic license yes, there <laughs> exactly exactly and this is to advertise movies then that are currently running in india yes to advertise movies and then to attract you know especially to attract uh, producers and uh, distributors, producers would, uh, you know, sort of uh, spend the money on these large-scale advertisements that are set up in this, on the city streets okay. to attract uh, distributors to buy the film. And then you mentioned politics. So where did politics play a role in this then? So it's really interesting. There's a re an interconnection between cinema and politics in, um, in the southern state of oh. Tamil Nadu uh, in India. And that interconnection actually goes back about 75 years mm -hmm. uh, to about the 1940s when there was a nationalist uh, political party that used um, cinema. Uh, first, they used political, they used theater, popular theater, oh, I see. and then entertainment cinema to uh, sort of promote their political ideology. Oh, how interesting. And so these politicians are also were cinema stars oh. because what happens is that you know, I don't know if you've seen any Indian cinema, but um, Indian films are pretty much all musical melodramas. Yes, right. right? Yes, and they have, and they and they encourage multiple viewings because they have uh, songs and uh, dialogue and um, and choreographed dances and um, and fight sequences mm -hmm. that um, and the narratives are very predictable and pleasurable. So people, you know, enjoy them a lot. And when these political parties embedded an ideology, a radical political ideology about overturning social hierarchies that were centuries old, these films became incredibly popular. I see. How uh, fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And then the actors and the music directors and uh, 
um, and the script writers became, you know, enormously influential in the political sphere. Oh, also, how fascinating! Well, so you've put all this in a book, correct? Yes. Give us the name of your book. Uh, and the book is called Celluloid Deities: The Visual Culture of Cinema and Politics in South India. And we can get that book. Yes, it's okay. actually published in uh, Lanham, Maryland, by uh, Roman and Littlefield Terrific. Publishers. So well, it's <laughs> a fascinating <laughs> subject. I'm sure the book is filled with beautiful images and great information about the history of the, the interconnection between politics and film. and uh, So I want to thank you, Minda Jacobs, so much for being here, and congratulations on your book. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm Carolyn Black-Sotir, and this is SMART, the Baltimore County Arts and Culture Show.